All right, welcome back everyone. Today I thought we would do things a little differently. You've probably gotten tired of me just sitting in front of a green screen for an hour and 20 minutes. So I figured uh, today I would sit in front of a beach for an hour and 20 minutes. Um, but rather, uh, rather than having a traditional lecture with uh, slides and whatnot, I figured it might be useful to um, show you more hands-on things. So I'm actually gonna just share my screen and we could like play with stuff in R uh, for the entirety of the, the lecture today. I wanna show you some secrets to uh, regression modeling or tips and tricks. Um, I, again, just to remind you, I by no means expect you to learn R or require you to learn R. Um, it's just the only thing that I know how to use to some extent. So I'm, I'm limited uh, in my ability to demonstrate these concepts uh, by my knowledge of, of R and nothing else. So, uh, you know, use whatever you're comfortable with or have access to or whatever you want. I, I could not care less what software you're using. Um, let's see. Oh, um, a few announcements. One. I posted three example final papers uh, from a previous year in our shared Google Drive, the one with all the reading materials. So if you still have the link to that, you can find um, three reports from uh, previous years there. Uh, and um, just to give you a sense of kind of how former students have written about their research projects for the class. So hopefully that's useful. Uh, let's see. Oh, um, I am still short one volunteer to present a paper on Thursday this week. So we're going to have a session, uh, again, dissecting a bunch of research papers. Uh, they all use regression modeling in some form. So I want you to, as you're reading those, I want you to focus on the so quantitative analysis and the regression modeling parts of the papers. Uh, and the list is in the Slack channel. Um, I can, I guess if you have access to that, we have gotten volunteers for all but one of the papers. So I'm still looking for one volunteer. I could do it. Uh, is this Vasilevsky at all? It is, it happens to be the one that nobody liked. So that's the one that's left over. Okay. I'm sorry for you, Jeremy. No, it's all right. I have to read his papers anyway. Right. So th th thank you. Th that's that. Let's see. Um, any other announcements? Uh, anything else you wanted to ask about? Um, if you're like trying to come up with a thing to go through in this uh, lesson, um, maybe like I've been noticing that I don't have like linear QQ plots and I have no idea what this means about the data or the shape of it. I assume it says something about the shape of the data, but I don't know. Okay, yeah, so we'll we'll make sure to look at some of those. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll bring some up, I'll put some on. One other thing I just remembered, uh, some of you have asked for uh, essentially an office hour to dissect uh, the homework assignment, the one I handed out last Thursday, the one where I asked you to do some kind of linear regression modeling on uh, two example data sets and report back your findings. Um, we have scheduled uh, an hour tomorrow at uh, tomorrow at 2 p.m. Um, so actually I was thinking about this. Jenna, maybe we use the class Zoom uh, so that people can find it easier, whoever wants to join, instead of the one you had. So yeah, just no problem. The same Zoom we're on uh, right now. I could anybody, change the, the calendar in late. Anybody feels like they need more practice with regression modeling, uh, they're welcome to stop by tomorrow at 2. We're just going to, I guess, I don't know, go over the homework together uh, and I will try to answer questions about the homework and probably we're going to look at the data itself and like some models in R or whatever software you're using, something like that. That's the plan for tomorrow. So you're welcome to drop in um, or, or not. It's entirely up to you. Okay, uh, anything else? Yeah, sorry. Is it from uh, two to three tomorrow? Two to three tomorrow, yep. Okay, got it. I... 
I guess, Jenna, we can just record it, right? And share it with folks if people can't attend but are otherwise interested. Yeah, I don't mind. <laughs> I suspect some of the questions. So I suspect if you have questions, then chances are you may have some of the same questions. It's easier if I don't have to answer them like individually uh, every time they come up. That's why I'm trying to do this um, uh, tomorrow. All right. So I guess let's let's do this thing. So what I'm, let me see if I can share my screen. Um, oop. Uh, does something happen? You're seeing my my R. Cool. All right. So I guess I have a few things that I'm hoping to cover, uh, but no real agenda. I, you know, I don't have a slide deck to go through, uh, unlike usual. So you feel free to interrupt and ask for anything you might want that uh, whatever I'm going to start talking about inspires you. So let me start with. Something, um, something about sort of inter interpreting these models. Uh, we've oh, there is one more thing before I forget. Um, I posted the slides and recording from last Thursday. Um, in the slide deck, you will find a few more examples at the end of the deck that I didn't get a chance to go through in class. Uh, there's two or three more examples of modeling at the end of the slide deck. So if you're just sort of looking for more examples of how to do things or like how to think about these models, you could find a few more at the end of the slide deck from last Thursday. Um, they're not in the video, obviously, because uh, otherwise I would have covered them in class. All right, so um, back to this. So we're looking at a data set um, that explores the relationship between total monthly earnings and the number of factors that may influence that, uh, including a person's IQ, a measure of knowledge of their job or sort of expertise um, determined based on some, some questionnaire, uh, number, number of years of ex experience on the job, uh, number of years of education, uh, and number of years at their current job, a tenure, okay, uh, and some other things. Uh, and we have a data set for close to 2,000, uh, sorry, uh, close to 1,000 to 900 something individuals that we're looking at, okay? So the data set, um, well, looks like this. So it's just a table. Um, monthly earnings is the column we're interested in modeling. And there's a bunch of these other uh, variables that I mentioned, the average uh, weekly working hours, person's IQ, knowledge, score, years of education, years of experience, tenure, and so on, okay? So, you know, nothing too... Um, unusual. So let's say we're interested in, in modeling the uh, monthly earnings okay, as a function of um, five explanatory variables, including IQ, knowledge score on the standardized test, uh, years of education, years of experience, and tenure. Years of experience is sort of professional experience, tenure is at the current job. That's the difference uh, using this data set. Okay, so this is a model much like models you've seen before. So I have I've estimated this. By the way, uh, what you're seeing here, this is a, it's called an R markdown notebook. So what you're seeing is a combination of text and code, and you could have these executable blocks that um, I could then sort of compile into some kind of uh, HTML web page that is more readable and has things like that. Um, so this is sort of a cool feature. If you're used to Python, IPython, Jupyter notebooks, that kind of stuff, if you're used to that, that's very similar. Uh, all right, back to back to our model. So this is this is the model summary. So you're seeing here estimates for the coefficients. You're probably used to the notation by now. These are the different estimates for the different coefficients for these variables. Uh, and there are levels of statistical significance on the right-hand side. Um, you see this shorthand notation with the little stars that tells you um, that one star means the p-value is between uh, 0 0.01 and 0.05. Uh, three stars means it's below 0.001, okay? This is just a standard R notation for um, 
these regression summaries. I think the notation is pretty standard in general. I think most statistical software packages will use similar notation for these. If you're used to Stata or something like that, then it's probably very similar. Um, okay, so how do we interpret this? Like, uh, let's see, somebody, um, let's say we're interested in um, comparing the effects of years of education versus years of experience. How do I read this model, this model summary? Uh, controlling for everything else, that uh, every extra year of education corresponds to an additional seven, uh, 47, I don't know, maybe dollars of mm -hmm. monthly income increase. Mm -hmm. Uh, controlling for every, uh, everything else that every years of experience uh, corresponds to additional $11 uh, monthly. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, thanks. So, uh, you know, you might remember from before that the, the way we're interpreting these coefficients is assuming everything else but that coefficient we're reading, everything else, all the other variables stay fixed and we're only... Um, so the interpretation here assumes that everything else stays fixed and the coefficient estimate is the effect of one unit increase in that particular variable, say, say a one year increase in education or experience on the outcome, which in, in this case is the amount of monthly earnings and say dollars or something. Okay, so based on this, if I would ask you to compare the effect of education or experience uh, right, if you want to make a recommendation here, like what would you say based on this? What's more, uh, where do I get more return for my investment? Should I invest in more education or should I invest in getting more experience? What's more valuable to me if I'm trying to optimize for higher monthly earnings? Someone other than Bobo. The so it looks like we should like invest more on education, but I also have a question here. So do we have to normalize the, the feature? So, so for instance, the Y unit for years of education may not be comparable to one year of, well, one year, I think this makes sense, but like, let's say IQ compared with years of education. Like yeah. one, their unit Thank may not be comparable. Right? Thanks, C C uh, CJ, that's a great point. So uh, it, it becomes hard to compare IQ with education, say. Um, I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. I've specifically chosen these two variables for the discussion now because they're both measured in years. They're on the same scale and, and unit. So, um, right. So you're, you're saying we're probably better off investing in um, education. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, because we're getting more uh, return out of this, right? Yeah. Um, and for every year of education, we're getting um, 47 more dollars uh, of, of return, right? All right. Um, do, do people agree? Does anybody think differently? How do you interpret the intercept here? Is it meaningful at all? Is it negative dollars? Um, the intercept is not meaningful in this case. If this assumes the intercept is where IQ knowledge years of education and so on are all zero, right? Yeah, which cannot happen. Good? Yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's not a meaningful value because it's sort of outside of the possible range, I guess. Yeah, good question. All right. Um, so, right, we talked about that. Um, so now here's, here's the catch. Um, and I think CJ already intuited to this. Um, here's the catch. So yes, years of education and years of experience are both on the same scale and use the same unit. 
they both use years as the unit. So intuitively they're comparable directly, right? So the, co the coefficient estimates are intuitively comparable directly because they're both measured in the same unit. But um, as it turns out in, in this data set in particular, one additional year of education and one additional year, year of experience are quite different things. So let me illustrate that. So here what I'm doing is um, plotting. So here's a histogram of um, all the values in the data set for years of experience. So you could see that um, this looks normally distributed, sort of a bell curve. That's one thing to note. Uh, and the other thing to note is that there's quite the, the range here. So, um, you know, except for um, a few people, you could look at, let's see, years of experience here. So the second part here. Um, except for a few people with relatively little experience, you can have, you have lots of data points, lots of people with all kinds of values for the amount of years of experience in this. Years of education looks quite different if you look at that in comparison. Years of education varies roughly between 12, which is when people finish high school, and 16, which is when people finish college. Um, and there's very, very few people that have less education than that relatively, and very, very few that have more education than that. So most people are somewhere between 12 and 16 years of education in this data set. Okay, so you can see from this that a year, one unit increase in education is probably a very different beast from one year increase in, in experience based on just how these things are distributed uh, and the actual ranges of the variables. Does that make sense? So, what you could do here is you could standardize, you could normalize, like CJ said, um, these variables for years of experience and years of education so that they're more directly comparable, so that one unit increase in education means roughly the same as one unit increase in um, experience, which is not the case right now, even though they're using the same unit, just because of how they're distributed and their range. Um, so what I've done is I have, instead of using the raw values for these two variables, I've used the z-score for them uh, instead. The z-score is this transformation that um, standardizes a variable such that they have mean zero and standard deviation of one. So you, for, for every value, you subtract the mean and you divide by the standard deviation. That's how you obtain a z-score. Okay, so what this allows you to do, so here, I'm gonna estimate this model again. And, um, so here's what the model estimates, uh, coefficient estimates look, look like for this uh, standardized model. What do you see different? Do you see any difference? Um, years of experience and years of education are closer together as far as um, increase in value goes, according to the z-scores. So this is about twice as much return for, oh, by the way, so the way to interpret these, uh, so remember before we were interpreting these as saying for every, let me scroll back here, here we are. For every unit increase in, for every one extra year of education, you can expect 47 more dollars a month holding everything else constant. Right, so for every one unit, one year increase in uh, education. Here, the way we're interpreting this now is to say, we're looking at this one, for every one standard deviation, 
worth of years increase in education, you can expect a hundred and four dollars more a month. Okay, and the same for this other one. For every standard deviation increase in years of experience, you can expect $52 roughly uh, more a month, holding everything else constant. Okay, so this, in many cases, this makes more sense because um, even if these things have the same unit, they're both measured in years, um, it's not the same to increase education by one year as it is to increase professional experience by one year just you know as far as making policy recommendations or uh, other recommendations based on such an analysis there is not the same the intervention is not the same and for, for both of them it's not equally practical to increase education by one as it is to increase experience by one so that's why um, in some cases, like this one, arguably, it makes more sense to reason about this in terms of standard deviations from the mean. Okay. Uh, and you're right. So you can see here how the estimates themselves are also somewhat different. Um, like education is worth twice as much as experience in this standardized model, and it was worth... Um, I don't know, four times or more as much than the previous one. That makes sense? By the way, one thing we haven't done, Jeremy was asking for, so let's, let's give him. Jeremy was asking for some, um, some plots. So let's show Jeremy some plots. So here is what some of these plots look like. Start from the beginning. This is the plot of residuals versus fitted. What, what do you see? Does anything strike you as? Offending seems pretty harmless, right? Uh, is that it has, I trying to remember the pronunciation had a cast Stasticity problem. Heteroscedasticity. Because the the deviation seems to be correlated. The deviation of the error, the residual seems to be correlated with the fitted value. A little bit, yeah. I, I think I I think I see that. I agree with that. Yes. Um by the way, the other thing um to I guess take home is that real models estimated on real noisy data are always going to be messy and essentially in my experience uh, you will always find violations of all of these assumptions the thing to ask yourselves is so how severe do they do they seem rather than if they're present at all i think the answer is always yes to you know is, it, is this like a textbook example of a random pattern probably not but it's never going to be uh, unless I artificially generate a data set to illustrate that for sort of you know, classroom purposes, no real data set is ever going to be um, captured by a simple model like this accurately enough so that you have well behaving residuals and everything else. Um, so I agree with Bobo. This is a little bit, there's a little bit of this uh, funneling or whatever the term was that we see here. Um, but overall, it's not super bad. The other one that Jeremy, uh, in, in my interpretation, you're welcome to disagree. Um, the other one that Jeremy was asking about was this QQ, QQ plot. We didn't really talk about this before. Has anybody done any reading about QQ plots? Does anybody know what they are meant to um, illustrate or, or visualize and how to interpret them? From what I've seen, the um, deviation from this line on this plot indicates some sort of imbalance in the data, um, whether it's skewed or bimodal or whether it's normal or not, essentially. Yeah, so the, what I think you're supposed to do with these plots is to check whether the points 
the residuals fall on this diagonal line. If they do, that would indicate that the residuals are normally distributed. Uh, these standardized residuals are normally distributed, which is one of the assumptions of the model uh, for the model to be valid. We talked about a number of these assumptions that need to hold for the model to be valid and interpretable and sort of usable in practice, this being one of them. And you know, here you might conclude based on this, you know, that the here to, at both ends, the residuals tend to deviate from this diagonal line and therefore they're sort of not quite normally distributed. And this is probably not quite the uh, most appropriate model for this data set would be the conclusion. Can we tell what the problem might be based on this graph? Um, yeah, uh, I, I think the problem is likely that the relationship is nonlinear. So we're using a model that's sort of too simple to capture this relationship that's more complex, uh, is what I think is happening here. Just a follow-up question. If the relationship is not linear, should we see the, in the first graph, should we see the red line, the fit the line is not flat? Yes, we should. We should see there too. Yeah, so. Uh, um, yeah, I, I don't know that I, that I know how to reconcile that. What I would do is probably try modeling this in, in a few different ways, maybe including some transformations like you know, logging and stuff like that for some of these variables. Um, maybe logging the outcome. So one thing you could look at is how this thing is distributed. That's the response variable, the dependent variable. Maybe you want to do something. So it looks pretty normal. It's not too bad. Maybe you want to do something with these outliers here towards the right hand side. Maybe this is what's sort of causing some of that, um, some of what you're seeing there. Um, to, I, I'm not sure. Like this will require more debugging. Um, and I don't want to spend sort of all, all lecture today doing this, but uh, you know, feel free to try this and let me know what you come up with. I'm curious to see a, a better behaving model uh, with better behaving diagnostics uh, on this data set. I'll, uh, um, I've actually, I don't know if I've posted this already. I will post this in the same folder, um, the code and the data that I'm using right now. But yeah, let me know. Let me know if you find out how to make this behave better. Okay, so let's look at something else. We talked about um, we talked about how experience and education are different things. We scaled them to normalize them. We saw how the um, coefficients have changed. Um, okay. Oh yeah. So another thing to note, perhaps, is that. All the other things, all the other estimates in the model have remained unchanged. Okay, so we've transformed two of these variables and uh, the only thing that was affected were the coefficient estimates for those two, everything else stayed the same. So you can, you can confirm that. Um, okay, so now back to this other issue that CJ raised. Like what if you wanna compare um, IQ to education or something like this. So uh, the example I have here is, is similar as comparing this uh, knowledge score on some standardized test similar to IQ uh, to education, which are measured in different units. So they're, they're incomparable directly. So here, essentially you have no choice, right? If you want to interpret these and make recommendations, you have no choice but to standardize, to normalize these variables. Uh, otherwise you, just there's no way of comparing them directly uh, because they're not even measured in the same things. Um, so you know, I could I could do that. I have 
normalize these two variables, knowledge and, and education. Um, and I can compare their estimates in a similar way uh, as I've done with um, experience in education. Okay. So you have one standard deviation more education gets you $104 a month more on average. One standard deviation more knowledge gets you 63 more dollars a month on average. Okay. So that, that's it for this. This was about scaling slash normalizing and so interpreting predictors. Uh, any, any thoughts or questions on this before I move on to something else? Um, what about years of experience and tenure? It's kind of interesting that it's even possible to hold one of these constant because they're very clearly related. So yeah, I, so I don't know. How would you examine that? Cool. So years of experience, uh, as I understand this data set, refers to overall professional experience. So like from the, your first job to now. Um, tenure, sorry, from your first ever job to now. Uh, right. Tenure refers to your tenure with the current job. So you know, in theory, you could be really, really senior, but have only just joined the current organization. Um, so you, you'd have really high years of experience, but no tenure, right? So mm -hmm. there's no correlation in, in that direction. There is though in the opposite direction, you're right. So like if you have really long tenure, you must also have at least that much experience, right? So it's sort of only in, in one direction, not in the other. What, what would you do to diagnose that you can even model both of these things at the same time? We talked about it last time. We talked about a, a problem that comes up with, with these kind of models. Sorry, I interrupted somebody. Yeah, I, to test for the multi-collinearity. Mm -hmm. Somebody that's not Bobo or Jeremy or CJ. Does anybody remember what that was about, multi-collinearity? Is that when um you have uh multiple um I guess of these uh, variables multiplied together? No, that was the interaction term or interaction effect. Um, but you're close. You are close. Let's see if I can. Here is Let's see. Can I just share my whole screen without just sharing the window? Yes. Maybe this is better. So this is something we talked about last time. We talked about this problem of collinearity. So if you remember, if you have predictor variables in your model that are very highly correlated with each other, this artificial example that I gave, you have the, these x1 and x2 variables, not just highly correlated, but actually identical. They're just copies. x2 is a copy of x1. If you have this, and you're trying to estimate these coefficients that go in front of uh, x1 and x2 in this regression model. Uh, it's just impossible to do that because um, if you look at this example on the bottom here, any one of these specifications or any one of these estimates is equally good. They all perfectly capture this relationship. Okay. Um, just because of how this, this data was created, right? So why? is, <clears throat> excuse me, <coughs> is either, um, so this x1 plus x2 combination, or it's just two times x1 without any of x2, or, you know, it could be 
three times x1 minus an x2 and, and so on right so you, you can come up with infinitely many equally good models of this particular relationship here so when you have highly correlated predictors in a regression model be it linear or otherwise it becomes very hard for the model to distinguish between these uh, equally plausible combinations right and then um you just um any anything can happen right so the standard errors on the coefficients and therefore the coefficient estimates themselves and even their signs may make no sense whatsoever right so you could end up with anything it's completely you know unpredictable what will happen um so i guess that's where maybe jeremy's question was was hinting at because you know if you, if you expect that experience and tenure are very highly correlated uh and you know they are at least in one direction as we were just talking um then you know maybe you shouldn't be modeling them jointly like i have uh, right now because that would mean that their estimates the ones you see here uh these 11.8 and 6.2 they may not mean anything they may be super inaccurate right uh if they're if they're highly collinear then you know i can't really trust these things at all right i, I haven't been able to narrow down the relationship enough to, to you know interpret these that's kind of the idea so there's multiple ways to diagnose this um it's essentially computing these pairwise correlations between pairs of predictor variables independent variables in your model it's that's essentially the way to do this there's, there's like different ways of, of doing this there's one particular um function um that's readily available called the variance inflation uh, factor it's one measure that allows you to sort of quickly diagnose this there are other measures that that do this and other ways of doing this it's by no means the only one this is just one way of of diagnosing this so um in this particular case I could uh, I could compute this variance inflation factor, and you see that it gives me some value for every one of the variables in the model. Um, and if you refer to some of the readings that I posted, um that go into more detail about so how this variance inflation factor is computed and what it means exactly you will also learn more about sort of the uh the, the definition and therefore the interpretation of this the short of it is that where are we where's my there the short of it is that all of these are low enough for multi-collinearity to not be a concern in this particular model so you know even though jeremy's right and actually i could show you that so look i could compute the correlation between uh tenure and years of experience so there's some 24% correlation between these two, linear correlation between these. Okay. So even though there is certainly some correlation between them, uh, as we have argued, it's not high enough for these to be considered collinear and therefore for the model to suffer from this multi-collinearity problem and therefore for the estimated coefficients to be invalid and so on. By the way, so going back to this example um here what you would do is so let's say i could probably just show you this let's see uh let's do another one of these so y equals what do we have 12 13 10, 5, 7, 12, 15. 
x1 equals 6, 6.5, 5, 2.5, 3.5, oops, 6, and 7.5. x2 equals the same. Okay. So here, uh, summary, say y as a function of x1 plus x2, like this, okay. Summary of the model M. So cool, note what happened. What happened is I got an estimate of two for the coefficients of x1. And I got a an, an not applicable, an NA for the coefficient of x2. So the model was smart enough to realize that I maybe accidentally copied these things. Oops. Um, and um, that this cannot actually happen in practice. Probably if I were to go away, if I were to have tried this, um, yeah, so this thing would have also failed, would have told you that there are ADS coefficients in the model. So you can't actually, you can't even compute this variance inflation factor because you've just sort of duplicated, you've copied um, a variable. Let's say if I do something like this. I've just changed them a little bit. Okay, not much, barely just changed them. And you could see how now I am getting some, um, estimates for these, but they're basically just random, right? It makes no sense. Okay? And actually, you know, again, the model is very smart. You get a perfect R squared, so you, your model fits the data perfectly. This never happens. Uh, and it's smart enough to tell you that you can't really trust these because, um, because they're weird. Um, here, here's what the variance inflation factor would look like. Here, the estimate for these is 100 and 14-ish for this variance inflation factor when normally it's supposed to be like one or two. So this would sort of tell you again that you can't keep both of these in your model because they're very highly correlated, right? So what you would end up doing is you would just remove one of them from your model then re-estimate your model. Um, obviously you can't, you can run that with just one. So here you would sort of get what you expect, right? That y equals two times x1. Okay, this guy. That makes sense? Okay, so enough of wages. Let's talk about, let's see. So this is gonna be cool. So we're stepping this, uh, this up one notch. We're gonna talk about mixed effects models. So now one of the assumptions that we said needs to hold for these linear regression models to be valid is that observations be independent of each other. You remember that from last time? Okay, so now can you give me an example of I don't know, data or relationships uh, between variables where um, this may not hold. Can you give me an example of something where the observations may not be independent of each other? Somebody that's not Jeremy or Bobo or Kyle or CJ.
Okay, then somebody that is Jeremy or Bobo or Kyle or CJ. The example I have was that, for example, we want to predict uh, uh, the outcome variable is the, the score or the, the class performance of students. Uh, and the independent variable was, for example, the age of the students, the gender of the students. But students uh, are in different classes. And for the students in the same class, they probably have the same teachers and they are affected by the same kind of environment. So they are correlated in some way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. So uh, that's a great example. So there's lots of examples where there's some natural grouping or hierarchy in the data as collected. The one you gave is a very good one of students being nested within classrooms uh, and um, the students that, sorry, the observations for students from the same classroom are probably not entirely independent of each other, like you said, because those students have some of the same teachers and whatnot, right? So between classrooms, much more likely for the observations to be independent within the same classroom, less so. Um, another example, the, the typical example, is when you're collecting uh, variables for the same individuals at, at multiple times. Right? I just measure you multiple times. I measure you and you know, everyone else I measure multiple times. So therefore, the observations that I collect from each one of you are not independent of each other, right? Because they have you to connect them uh, between observations, right? Um, or here, this example that I have right now is about um, height in children. Um, I may have talked about this a few lectures ago when we talked about regression to the mean. There was this example of how uh, children of really tall parents are less likely to be that tall. Remember that we talked about uh, that a, a few lectures ago, right? Just because when, when you've sort of observed such extreme values becomes less likely to continue to observe similarly extreme values the next time you make observations. Um, so th this is this data set. This is a data set of height in children. And um, one issue here potentially is that we have children from some of the same families, right? Children with the same siblings with the same parents. These observations are not independent of each other, right? Because they have the same parents. Okay, so this would be another example of a data set where by construction, the observations are not independent of each other. And therefore any of these standard linear regression models are invalid by definition, they're inapplicable by definition. Like you sort of have to satisfy this fundamental assumption that observations are independent of each other. Otherwise you can't even use the thing to begin with. Again, you know, obviously you can use it and you can estimate it and it would give you some numbers, but the point is you shouldn't, right? Sort of, um, it's, um, it's, it's an invalid application of the method. Yes, you know, R will still give you some, will spit out some numbers and if you throw some data at it but you shouldn't be doing that in the first place. Okay, so now let's look at some of these. I have this data set here, uh, but you're taking up too much space and I can't click on these buttons. Um, okay, so I have this data set here that contains about a thousand observations. This is the original data set from the, I don't know, 1700s or whenever the study was done. Um, the study that talked about regression to the mean that I referenced in class. Um, and there's a number of variables recorded in this data set, including a factor to identify the family that these children were, were part of. And note how there are 205 different families represented in this data set even though there are a total of 934 observations. So that means that, uh, I don't know, uh, on average, these families have four plus children each, okay? Because there's only 205 different families, 
right? So you, clearly some families must have multiple children to end up with that many observations. Um, you have measurements of the height in inches of the father and mother of the uh, child. Um, I'll come back to the Smith parent height. You have, um, I guess the number, I don't remember what this is, the number of children in that family, maybe. Um, the index number of that particular child you're measuring within that family, right? So one, two, three, four, these would be the four children from this first family that has four children, okay? Um, there is a gender variable. Note how, because this was the 1700s, this is only a binary gender variable. So people back then weren't yet thinking about non-binary gender. Um, and the height uh, measured also in inches of these children. Okay, so that's the data. So now here's what this, um, well, we can, we can skip this. Uh, here's what some of this data looks like. Let's see. So what I've done is um, computed some of these summary statistics. So the one that you see here is the distribution of the number of children per family. So you can see that families have a median of six children in this data set. And the maximum number is 15 children for the same family in the data set. The minimum is one, okay? So also note how back in the, I don't know, 17 or 1800s, people were having a lot more children than we seem to be these days. Um, and this is the breakdown in terms of binary gender of those children. Uh, and finally, this is, the last one is a distribution of the height of the children in inches. So uh, the median of 66.5 inches for those children. Um, here is a, um, these are called violin plots. They're the same as box plots, except prettier. Um, in, in that box plots are just boxes and these violin plots uh, are basically mirrored density, kernel density plots on, on each side. Uh, so this is sort of, um, it, it shows you the actual shape of the distribution rather than just the box where, where the points are. Uh, and I have broken this down by binary gender of the children, and I'm showing you the distributions of height in inches for these children. Okay, so you can see how uh, the male children seem to be taller than the female children. Okay, which is not surprising. Um, all right, so let's say, um, let's say I want to model the child height here from this data set. Okay, what's the simplest possible model you could think of? Hint, it's on the screen. Take the. <laughs> Uh, given the child's gender, guess that they are the mean of the distribution. Perfect. Yes, that's the second simplest. It's not the absolute simplest. The absolute simplest is just take the mean period. Ah. So you see that represented here um, with this notation. So all I have is an intercept here that um, basically gives me an estimate of the mean of that entire population or entire distribution of children, okay? 66.75 inches, okay? uh, But you're right, the, the simplest possible, you know, plausible model is this other one that actually takes into account the gender because we've seen that that seems to have a huge impact uh, or correlation with height. So let me comment this one out. So we don't get confused by it. Right, so here's what this looks like. How do I read this?
somebody that is Ben? We expect that if using, I think, females as like the baseline, if you are a male, you're, we expect you to be 5.13 inches higher. Mm -hmm. Right. And there's nothing to, we haven't controlled for anything. Right. So it's just sort of the only thing we've modeled is height as a function of binary gender. Okay. Right. Um, why, why did I, why did this happen? Why am I estimating the uh, effect for male children height? Um, where did I specify that? Like why, why is this happening? I, I don't seem to have done that anywhere. Why is the, in other words, why is the reference here uh, female gender? You're going to laugh. It's because R looks at these alphabetically. There's no, there's no real reason. There's no scientific or uh, analytic reason for this. It's just a silly implementation quirk of the R language. Okay, so that's why. So let's say... Um, um, oh yeah, so we can look at some, come back to this, we can look at some diagnostics since we, uh, Jeremy wanted to see more QQ plots. So here's residuals versus fitted for this model that we just looked at. What do you see? Well, one that is not very interesting, right? Because there's only two values for this and nothing else. So really, um, you know, it's, it's not very informative. Uh, but two, look how pretty this one is, huh, Jeremy? So it turns out height in humans is very normally distributed. And therefore also the residuals of height are also very normally distributed. So that's nice. So this is one of the rare examples when you will see something behave so cleanly uh, in, a, in a real data set. Okay, so let's um, say- I have a question about the residuals plot. Yep. Um, does this, like, because technically this is a pattern around the line uh, and that usually indicates, indicates a bad fit. Um, does that apply in this case? Or is it because there's like only one variable and it's kind of like a binary variable yeah i, I think both i okay. think um i think probably you shouldn't have looked at these plots to begin with because by definition you expect them to be bad because there's just this one binary variable and nothing else in there so really there's no way this would could have looked any different um but also um Yeah, so I guess the pattern would be what? The pattern would be that these are clearly separated in two groups and they're not just kind of a cloud of points, right, in this space. So there, there is a pattern, you're right. But I think it's both. It's that this is insufficient to begin with, but there's also a pattern as it turns out. Um, okay, let's see. This is this is a plot of the residuals, I think, um, for the two groups. And you can see that they're more or less normally distributed. They kind of look, well, each half, each half, vertical half of these colored plots looks more or less like a uh, bell curve. So that's kind of an indication that uh, they behave pretty cleanly, uh, as you have seen from this thing as well, uh, I guess. 
Okay, so now um, a more interesting model. So here's one. A more interesting model is one where I, in addition to gender, I also include the height of the mom and dad, right? That's a much more interesting gender because we want to see if that makes any difference. We expect that taller parents will on average have taller children, right? So here's what this one looks like. You um, still get this uh, estimate for gender, very similar to the one we had before. So uh, male gendered children tend to be about five inches taller. But also note how there's now a statistically significant effect of both the mom and, and dad height here. Okay. What does this tell you? Can you conclude that dads have more of an impact on the height of their, their kids? Not really, because the distribution of father's height and the mother's height are different. They are different, but they're both normally distributed. But the standard deviation is different. The standard deviation, that's a good question. Uh, do I have that? It may not be. It might not be different. Uh, Sorry, this was a bad call. Let's try that. A little bit. It is a little bit different, I guess. The, there's higher standard deviation among dads. Um, okay, so also note how this new model with the parent's height explains about 63% of the variability in the data. The model we had before that only included gender of the kids explains only about 51% of the variability in the data. Okay, so the second model, the one with parents, is a better model. Okay. All right. So I guess I have, I have a question. So how can I reconcile the children's height is correlated with their parents and the regression to mean effect? So because based on the rule of regression to mean that it should be a negative effect. Oh, um, I think with the regression to mean effect there should be a negative effect only when the parents are really, really, really extremely tall or short, when, when the parents are really extreme. So like only at the very ends of the spectrum, the distribution. If the parents are super short or super tall, their kids are unlikely to be just as extreme, right? So their kids are probably gonna be more moderate so th there you expect to see this regression to the mean but by and large for the rest of the population you probably expect to see this um, correlation that you see here okay um let's see what else so we talked about 
that. Did um, you also say that like the effect that the height of the father versus the mother has is is not very different because the standard error puts them closer together? I you know I think I think I would interpret this as um, evidence that the dad's height maybe has more impact on um, on the kid's height than the mom's, but we could test that. We could do this. Remember from before? Does that make sense? Yeah. Ah, uh, yeah, you can see the difference more now. Yeah, so th this still remains remains different. So it's interesting. Um, I I think the standard deviations were for close enough, and the distributions were both normal and so on that you could have already expected this from the original uh, estimates. But this is more convincing, right? That. Uh, you know, now that I've standardized them, uh, it seems like the dad's height has more of an impact than the mom's. Interestingly. Okay. Um, right. So here's one example of how to deal with this silly issue of um, alphabetic ordering. So what I've done is I have reordered these this factor. So now the reference is the male binary gender instead of the default female alphabetically. I've explicitly told R what the reference should be. And I've re-estimated the same model. And look what changed. What changed? Gender male, gender female instead of gender male. Oh yes, and right. Because the estimation in the late, uh, direction is the opposite. Yeah, right. So now the reference has changed. The reference has become the thing you don't see here, right? The reference has become the male binary gender, and therefore the estimated coefficient for the female binary gender has the opposite sign, right? So. 5.2 inches shorter on average. That makes sense? And everything else stays the same. Um, okay, now here is um, the plot of residuals versus fitted for which model is this? The earlier one. Well, it doesn't matter. They're, they should be the same. Um, the, this is the plot for the earlier model. And what, what do you see in this? Patterns, hopefully. Do you see patterns? You see, so two clusters of points. Okay, so you know, even though we have included the parents' height in the model in addition to the binary gender variable, we still haven't quite solved this problem of there being patterns here. Uh, here is the same plot color coded to convince you that there are, in fact, two distinct point clouds in this. Um, so this would tell you that you're still not quite there, right? In terms of having a good model, because this isn't quite a random cloud of points. Do you agree? So could you like normalize the groups? Say multiply every female point by some amount, or. But that's essentially what the. 
estimated coefficient does, right? Right. So there's this one thing that we started the second half of the lecture from, but I haven't heard any one of you complain in the meantime. I started by telling you that you can't do what I've been doing to begin with, that everything I've been doing for this height modeling exercise so far has been illegal. I haven't heard you complain about that. You're just letting me get away with it. Okay, so why has it been illegal? Again, because as I showed you, some of these families have up to 15 children. Okay, so therefore, a lot of these children that you saw me model aren't independent observations. So I wasn't allowed to do any of what I did to begin with. No, okay. Bobo says I get a free pass. No, I I, I think there is a way to bypass that. There was a thing called cluster in R that they can adjust the water potential autocorrelation among samples. So it cool. can increase the standard deviation and adjust for this error. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's very close to uh, this other um solution that I had in mind here, which is to uh, use these mixed effects regression models. So actually, you'll, you'll see a few of the papers I asked you to present uh, on Thursday. You'll see that a few of them are using this different framework for regression modeling called mixed effects regression. Uh, instead of the only one we've ever talked about so far in the class, which was this standard linear regression. So let's take a step back and talk for a second about the following. If I want to, so we agree, I think, that these observations are um, not independent of each other, right? The, the children from the same family are not independent observations, so their heights are, are likely to be correlated. Um, so what are some ways, like, uh, not Bobo's specific, you know, function in R and, and whatnot, but what are some conceptual ways in which I could remove this existing correlation? What could I do to my data or how could I model this conceptually to remove this correlation, um, this uh, non-independence between some of these observations, uh, specifically children from the same families? What could I do? You could maybe take an average of the heights. Good, perfect, right? So I can replace, say, the 15 children from the um, big family with 15 kids. I could replace all those 15 observations by one, which is, say, the average of those 15, right? So, and I could do this for all the families that have multiple children. So now I have only one entry for every family, which is some aggregate of all the children from that family. Right? And at this point, I can assume that these have become independent observations and I can you know, go back to doing what I've been doing. Is average a better approach for this than say randomly sampling one of the children from each family? That's a choice you'll have to make and defend. Um, no, uh, I, I don't know. Um, I, I don't think so. But the meta point is you replace the 15 or N observations that are not independent by one, which is some aggregate of the N, okay, of, of your choosing. Okay, that's, that's one strategy. What's another strategy? Like at, at the other end, the extreme end of the spectrum. What's the exact opposite thing I can do? Could you make separate graphs for, or separate sets for each family? Cool. Yes, that's exactly right. I could model every family separately, right? And at that point, I've removed this, um, 
non-independence issue because I don't compare children across families. I only compare them within, a, within the same family, right? So these are conceptually, thank you, Kyle, that was great. Conceptually two ends of the spectrum in terms of what I could be doing to remove this non-independence issue, okay? So now, arguably none of these is, is all that great. Um, the one where um, I compute some kind of aggregate, say the average or whatever it might be, is not great because I'm losing a lot of information. Right? I, I, you know, I'm replacing information, more, I'm replacing more information by less information. It's, it's not great in that sense. The other one where I'm modeling every family independently, separately, I build a model for every family, is really not great at all because in the best case for me as a modeler, uh, I model this family with 15 kids. So I have 15 entries in there, right? But most other families will have way fewer kids. So I won't even be able to estimate these models in the first place. I just won't have enough data to, to estimate these coefficients, right? It'll just be, it'll be too uncertain. I actually have a have a question. I don't see how the solution solved the independent at the correlation, the correlated issue. Because let's just take the second solution. Uh, have a model for each family. So for each of the model, the data point should be uh, every single kid in that family. Mm -hmm. But the reason we have the problem in the first case is that we know there are correlation among those kids in the same family. Mm -hmm. So if we have a model for each family and we know those kids are in the same family are correlated, we didn't solve that problem. I think if we want to solve this problem, we should have children from different family. Let's say we randomly pick one children from different family. That might be a way to get a model. The, the problem only occurs when I'm combining, um, when I'm comparing say across families. If I treat each family as a separate modeling problem, I never compare across families. So the problem goes away by construction, right? It's as, it's, as if, it's as if my entire sampling frame, the universe from which I'm collecting data is only that family. Just like here, the universe from which I'm collecting data is say the entire world, right? You know, you, you could say even at this point, you could say that uh, these things are not independent. We're all living on the same planet. We're clearly not independent. We all live on the same planet. We're not on such separate planets, right? So that, it's, it's that level of argument. You're not comparing across families. You know, within the family, you don't care that they're part of the same family. You just model them. You, you build one model for every family. Okay, so um, we're kind of getting out of time. So let me just so do this one, one more thing, uh, one or two minutes, and, and then we'll be done. Um, there's this entire different framework of mixed effects regression modeling, um, right? So everything you've seen before with the linear regression models that we talked about, all of those are called fixed effects. There's this new concept that I'm introducing now called a random effect. The combination of fixed effects and random effects in the same regression model creates this um, mixed effects regression framework. Uh, and um, I have some readings about this. Um, so you can, you know, you can go into the theory of, of what this means uh, in as much depth as you want. But just to show you one, one quick thing here, um, the way, the way I, I specify this is, is the one here. So this is, I'm using a different function because it's sort of a different, type of model uh, that's less important, but I'm still modeling height as a function of gender. I could add the parent height. I, you know, I don't happen to have it in this model, but that's, that's okay. Th those are fixed effects. So father and mother, I could do that. Plus this is the new thing that I'm introducing essentially. So here, what I'm saying is that there's a random intercept for family. Essentially, I'm saying that 
the children, each of these children that I'm modeling are nested, are grouped within families where family is some kind of uh, identifier. Okay, that's the only difference you're seeing here. This has all kinds of wonderful properties um, that we um, won't have time to talk about right now. Um, you can still see the same things that we saw before in terms of, you know, uh, there's still five inches, like female binary gender children are five inches shorter than male. You can see sort of some of the same things. With this addition of this random effect term that uh, basically accounts for this non-independence of the observations. Um, so you'll have to read more about this. I'll send you reading materials. Let me just end with this one thing, which is the following. So here I'm showing you in this very pretty plot, I'm showing you the, um, the range of heights of children within the, all the different families. Every one of these lines is a different family. Every, so this is 205 or so different families. There's 205 of these horizontal lines. And you could see how within some families, the ones here, children are consistently tall, so above average. Some families here at the lower end of the spectrum, children are consistently short, like below average. Like all the children within those families are shorter than the average and or taller than the average. This is because of this non-independence because they sort of belong to these uh, parents that are either very tall or very short probably. Anyway, so um, this is, uh, let's stop here. This is um, a very, very powerful framework for um, resolving this issue of non-independence of observations which as it turns out, comes up very, very frequently while modeling real world data. There's at least a couple of papers for Thursday that we'll see um, using this particular modeling framework because of the structure of the data they were modeling, because the data were non-independent in, in, in this way. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll leave you with this and take more questions if any.